afternoon, everybody. I think uh, as the time is up, uh, we will start the lecture. We hope that there will be uh, more of a crowd joining us, uh, you know, towards the, as we uh, proceed. Uh, so it is uh, we, this uh, therapeutic update lecture series is organized by the uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association Medicinal Drugs Committee. Uh, so we regularly have, you know, like once in two months uh, medicines updates. So today actually uh, we are having a symposium. Normally it's a one hour lecture, but here uh, we have decided to have a symposium on iron deficiency anemia where three experts uh, will be covering the topic uh, about iron deficiency anemia in three situations, in adults and in uh, pregnancy and in children. So it is my pleasure actually to um, introduce, uh, I think I will will uh, uh, introduce you know one by one before uh, they start. Uh, so first to introduce um, Dr. Upul Disanayaka, who is a consultant physician now at the National Hospital of Sri Lanka, uh, to start the symposium by talking on anemia in adults. Over to you, sir.
the fact that the demand for iron is high in childhood, adolescence, and pregnancy and in menstruating people, deficiency of iron is not worth the extensive diagnostic workup. You treat them with iron and worm treatment and investigate only if the patient does not respond to the iron. When you take a meal, most of its iron is in the cereals, in the ferric form, which will be liquefied through the uh, uh, change to ferrous form by the cytochromes in the rush border to be absorbed through the divalent metallic transport protein. Therefore, only up to 0 to 20 percent of narcolim iron is ingested is absorbed to the endocyte in The iron in the heme molecule which is present in fish and meat is directly transported through the heme carrier protein into the endocyte. And the both the heme and non-heme iron now goes into the labile pool inside the endocyte and this has to go through to the plasma, through the serosol membrane, through a carrier protein called ferroprotein. If not, the enterocyte will shed into the intestine, the iron inside will be lost to the body, and it will be a loss. A molecule called hepcidin produced in the liver destroys the transport protein, the ferroprotein, stopping the iron absorption. Not only that, it will uh, stop the, the macrophages releasing iron for the hemopoiesis. The sepsidin molecule is produced during iron overload and inflammatory conditions and is cleared through the kidney and more of this later. When the, the battery is running low, uh, can somebody uh, look at the computer? And when the iron becomes, uh, the demand for the iron outpaces the supply, first the iron stores will be depleted. Thereafter, the erythropoiesis will be iron deficient and ultimately iron deficiency anemia occurs. During the depletion of iron stores, the iron absorption is increased and the serum iron will be normal. However, the, the stores, the serum ferritin will be low. When there is further iron depletion, iron deficient erythropoiesis occurs. At this stage, the serum ferritin level drops below 15 micrograms and the transferrin saturation dropped below 15 percent. However, the hemoglobin MCV and MCH will still be within the reference range, although when you treat with the iron, there will be a significant rise in these parameters. When the depletion goes further, iron deficiency anemia occurs, resulting in microcytosis hypochromasia and poikilocytosis. The reticulocyte count will be low compared to the, the degree of anemia and the TIBC, serum iron and the transferrin saturation will be lower. If you do a bone marrow, which you don't, uh, the, the macrophages will show a total absence of iron and the, the, there will be tissue effects of iron deficiency like polyrrhea, carcinine, angular stomatitis, glossitis, and pharyngeal whips, or the Patterson Kelly syndrome, partial villus atrophy, and problems in the immunity. The causes for iron deficiency are many, but in the Sri Lankan context, it is bleeding and the poor diet. A blood loss of 6 to 8 ml per day cannot be compensated by dietary iron intake alone. The GI blood loss is commonly due to worm infestation, especially hookworm. 
But if your patient is at the at-risk age for cancer, worth investigating for bowel cancer. The menstrual blood loss is important, but Professor Kaluar has given you to do a bit. During hemodialysis, about 6 to 8 milligrams of iron will be lost during each cycle. If your patient is not a teenager or not menstruating or not pregnant, think about investigating the patient first with stool for color blood, upper and lower GI endoscopies, capsule endoscopy. <coughs> but screening for tumor markers like CEA and CA19.9 will be useful, but a negative tumor marker will not exclude the possibility of a colonic cancer. If you are, if you are exhausted the other possibilities of O, if your patient gives the history of dark urine early morning, think of paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. You may investigate for malabsorption, gluten induced enteropathy, helicobacter pylori, and necrohydria and AIDS inflammatory bowel disease. How do you manage the iron deficiency anemia? It is twofold. One is to identification and treatment of the underlying cause. Then correct the iron deficiency with inorganic iron. The drugs will be dealt with later. It will be sufficient to say that ferrous sulfate is the drug of choice and the dose is one time to three times a day. And remember, Entry cotton and sustained release preparations should not be used because much of this iron is released beyond the duodenum and the duodenum is the main site of absorption. When you treat with oral iron, the minimum rate of response should be 2 grams per every 3 weeks and it is necessary to treat 3 to 6 months to correct the deficiency of iron in the hemoglobin and in stores until the ferritin is normal. And if your patient fails to respond to oral iron, it is most commonly due to the patient not taking it. Or could be due to hemorrhage or malabsorption and you have to exclude the other causes of microcytic anemia. And a poor response may also be obtained if the patient has any infection, hepatic failure, underlying malignant disease or anemia or inflammation, remember the hepcidine. Parental iron is necessary when the oral iron is not tolerated and when there is gastrointestinal disease or inflammatory bowel disease because the hepcidine will stop the transport of iron in through the, the basal membrane and to replenish the body stores rapidly, especially when the iron deficiency anemia is first diagnosed in late pregnancy. And if your patient Iron loss can, cannot be sufficiently treated with oral iron as in patients with hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia. In patients with chronic renal failure, the iron is not, uh, the, the, the oral intake is less because of loss of appetite. <coughs> and then because of the hepcidine, the, the iron is not transported through the enterocyte and the macrophages can't release the iron. And hepcidine is not cleared through the kidney because of kidney failure. So these patients may need parental iron. And the calculation of the iron requirement, which I can't remember, is there on the, the leaflet of your bit of And thank you very much. Pregnancy. 
So, in order to uh, address that aspect, I would like to invite Professor Atula Palwaraji, who is a consultant obstetrician and a gynecologist, and a professor in obstetrics and gynecology in the Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalamu, to deliver the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, let me thank this Limi for inviting me to make this presentation. Uh, so when you talk about anemia in pregnancy, now compared to in a non-pregnant person, the definition of anemia in pregnancy is different. That's the first thing they have to know. If the first trimester the hemoglobin of 11 is the cutoff for considering a patient who is an equity So Above 11 is considered adequate. And when you come to the second trimester, the hemoglobin of 10.5 grams per deciliter is considered normal. We come to the reasons. And when you come to the third trimester as well, it's considered 10.5. And in postpartum first woman, HP of 10 is considered normal. The main reason for considering these values as normal is simply because there are physiological changes in pregnancy which changes the hematological parameters throughout the four weeks. Now, we know uh, the, when you in a pregnant woman, the plasma volume keeps on increasing from the start of the first trimester and peaks around 32 weeks and keeps at that level and an average increase about 40 to 50 percent increase in plasma volume of this in pregnancy. And compared to that, the red cell mass increase is less, about 18 to 20 percent. So there is a, a relative hemodilution that occurs throughout the pregnancy. And that is one of the reasons why hemoglobin of less than a non-pregnant person is considered normal in a pregnant woman. Because there is an increase uh, changes in the hematological parameters. I am not going to detail the all physiological changes, but these are the two main important things in relation to anemia. Now, if you look at the prevalence of anemia in a pregnancy, the WHO estimates, of course, in average for the whole world, you will realize it's, it will be much less in the Europe compared to the African countries. It's average about 40% of women who are pregnant do have iron deficiency anemia. Not iron deficiency, anemia. And majority of these cases are iron deficiency. And in Sri Lanka, there are various studies that have done, and the studies range just about one third of our women are anemic during pregnancy. Now, it is important to realize, as uh, the previous speaker spoke to you, the HP, hemoglobin level, does not mean always the iron stores are normal, and it is very important to have normal iron stores as well because it's for cellular function, the iron is important so that people can have symptoms like the lethargy and uh, other symptoms, even uh, it's important for your neuro uh, development. So they can have symptoms due to iron deficiency and the ferritin levels are considered different. Some of the studies have considered below 12 and some are considered have considered below 30 as iron deficient. So this is something that is important. And out of the people who are anemic, they say 30 percent are anemic, but the good thing is most have mild form of anemia. That's the point. You know? So if about if you take the anemia, we said about 30 percent, after about 20 percent of that 30 percent is you have mild anemia and we consider mild anemia uh, from about 9 to 10.9 or 11 grams per deciliter is considered mild 
and moderate is considered 7 to 8.9 or rather 7 to 9 and severe anemia is considered from 4 to 7. Right, so severe anemia is not common but it's rare. Uh, mostly are mild to moderate anemia. And even our other studies also, the several studies, uh, even here you find mild anemia is also 20% but moderate to severe possible 13%. Now, as it was mentioned earlier, the commonest reason for anemia, of course, could be physiological because because the hemodilution sometimes you can have mild form of anemia simply and during the period of gestation. As I told you earlier, because of the increased pressure volume, is higher in relation to the increase in residual mass. But if you take the real reasons, other than uh, the physiological chain, the iron deficiency is the commonest form of uh, anemia followed by folic acid deficiency in pregnancy and B12 deficiency is there. And there are other reasons for people to be anemic. Another important one, of course, I am not going to deal in length, of course, to realize even if the chemoprobabilities are seen in pregnancy. Now, why do women have iron deficiency anemia as the commonest cause. One, the first thing is to realize most of these studies done even in the first trimester of pregnancy shows that about 20 to 25 percent of women start their pregnancy with iron deficiency. So they start with a negative balance and of course the other reason is if you have pregnancies with a shorter interpregnancy interval, you have already lost iron in a previous pregnancy, you get pregnant within another six months or so, and you are starting with a much more a negative balance. So that's one of the reasons the short pregnancy interval could lead to iron deficiency. And in adults, as I, as I was mentioned earlier, about one per, one milligram per day iron is lost for various functions. And if you take the, to compensate for your menstruation in a female, it's calculated at it is about 0.8 milligrams per day. So that your iron requirement in a uh, female would be about 2 milligrams per day, considering your normal loss as well as the loss at menstruation. The iron requirement for a pregnant woman changes throughout pregnancy. What is required in the first time is basically if you look at the iron requirement, it is for the fetus, it's for the placenta, and for the fetal growth, the iron is required. And also the, in the latter part of pregnancy, the iron is required to store in the fetal liver because immediate newborn needs iron as well. So when you come to the first trimester, I said it's about 2 milligrams and when you come to the second trimester, your demand increased to about 4 to 5 milligrams due to increased red cell mass production as well as the placenta requirement and the fit requirement and when it comes to third trimester, your requirement of iron is about 6 milligrams per day. And as mentioned earlier, when you add the delivery, you lose about 250 milligrams of iron. If you look at that, your, the requirement, if you look, start with yeah. if you look at start from here, when you with the advanced pregnancy, then there's a normal turnover. You increase your requirement for your hemo increase in red cell mass, and the fetal requirement also is in purple, gradually increases throughout pregnancy and it gets the highest in the third trimester. And here not only the fetus and the placenta, there is active transfer of iron to the fetus in the last four weeks of pregnancy. So that the fetal iron stores are built up in during pregnancy, the last four weeks. That's why in the preterm you have more problems with anemia and things like that. Uh, if the baby is born early. Now, 
what are the risks to the mother and the fetus when they are the iron deficiency? There is good data to suggest that you know, uh, if you are iron deficient, if you are basically if you are anemic, I mean people are not really classified as iron deficient in some of these studies, but as we know, it's the commonest iron reason. Your risk of dying, the maternal death, is high in people who have anemia. Of course, the other problems comes. You need more blood transfusion, and that's a. It's people have higher risk of antenatal and postnatal sepsis if you're anemic. <coughs> Your risk of preterm birth is higher in patients who are anemic, and it is shown that requirement for uh, the intensive neonatal care is higher in women who deliver uh, with a low hemoglobin. Uh, and so it's also interesting to see whether there are these data or uh, there's good evidence that's coming up to suggest that if the mother is anemic, and if the mother is iron deficient, the fetal development can get affected. So there is uh, with decreasing uh, hippocampal volume and long term neural development could get affected in, with, in babies born to women who are anemic and especially iron deficient. And it is also observed that people who are iron deficient deliver babies with less birth weight. As I mentioned to you earlier, iron transport to the fetus mainly occurs in the last four weeks of pregnancy. And if the mother has iron deficiency and the mother has low iron stores, of course, you will realize obviously the newborn will have a depleted iron stores and it is seen, it is shown that babies born to mothers with iron deficiency have a high risk of anemia in the first year of life. And, and this is something that is uh, coming up. Whether uh, you see, in a, we know that growth restricted babies do have a higher risk of hypertension in later in life. Hypertension diabetes higher is higher in babies born with a low birth weight. Similarly, there are observations that if you are, if you have a, if the mother is anemic, you tend to have a, a larger placenta and a uh, placenta fetal ratio becomes high and that seems to have, a high, have an impact on development long term hypertension in later life. That is not 100% proven but there is evidence that is coming up uh, about these associations. Now, So because of this, it's very important for us to realize that iron deficiency is an important thing. Now in a pregnant woman, because of this increased requirement, it is recommended that you have iron supplementation. Now iron supplementation, as mentioned earlier, it's mostly done with oral iron and the commonest is ferrous sulfate, we will come to that later. And what you give to a pregnant woman as iron supplementation, either you can give as a daily dose of iron or there are people who cannot tolerate iron very well, you can give, there are different regimes that have been 
studied and shown to be more or less equally effective, giving it iron subtrophic every other day, or sometimes giving it once a week, especially in people who cannot tolerate this iron taking daily. So there are options that are available for your supplement. Now, we, when you have iron deficiency, the anemia management will really depend on these factors. Your severity of anemia, of course, the mother, mother is symptomatic. Here we are talking about the bloody being iron deficiency. We need to look at the urgency to correct anemia. When you, uh, as uh, mentioned earlier, if you are somebody who is in the first or second trimester, you have time to correct the anemia, you can take a different strategy compared to somebody who is detected to have anemia at 36 weeks, where it is important to correct urgently. Anemia has to be corrected because of the labor and the delivery. Iron deficiency has to be corrected because as I told you earlier, this is the time that iron is transported to feed. So that is also an important consideration. Then of course you need to look at what the long term management is going to be. Now it is important to realize, now we do have papers in CV anemia going hemoglobin period down to 8, 9 and all, but the critical level seems to be 6. If anybody has hemoglobin of less than 6, and that is where especially the fetal oxygenation could get affected because the oxygen transfer is active because you need the hemoglobin to transport the oxygen. So, uh, if anybody has hemoglobin less than 6, it's urgent that you need correct because there can be uh, effects that are occurring in the fetus which are not long term effects, which are short term problems like having fetal compromised because of the severe anemia, the fetal hypoxia could be there. So, if you have any of these hemoglobin going down to less than 6, it is important that you transfuse. Of course, if the mother is symptomatic, supposing she got not even uh, cardiac failure, uh, if the patient is significantly symptomatic, and obviously if there are any infections or any interfering with cardiac status, then you need to transfuse even earlier than that. Now, iron replacement, as I mentioned to you earlier, the prophylactic could be prophylaxis. If the hemoglobin is normal, if your uh, iron stores are satisfactory, you just to need to give iron to maintain. And recommended dose is uh, actually about 30 to 60 milligrams of elemental iron per day. Elemental iron per day, which is they are found in about 200 to 300 grams of ferrous sulfate. And you have other preparations like ferrous fumarate, which the total capsule dose is maybe different, but the target is to give elemental iron 60 milligrams per day. If somebody is anemic or iron deficient, you need to give a, a therapeutic dose of iron, which is about 100, 120 milligrams of the elemental iron per day. And there are, of course, there are various uh, studies done and various uh, theories that are being built up whether we should sort of change the dosage depending on the serum ferritin levels. When, uh, when somebody has got serum low ferritin level, do they need a higher dose of elemental iron? As I mentioned earlier, different regimes are there to supplement, either giving it every day, especially they can tolerate, but otherwise you can give it every other day or even once a day. Now, in, sorry, this is crowded, but don't worry about it. There are so, just to uh, mention that there are several oral iron preparations that are they are the ferrous sulfate is perhaps the most commonly used uh, preparation. 
because it's easy to absorb it and its availability is high in ferrous sulfate. You have ferrous fumarate, ferrous gluconate, and of course, various polysaccharide ion complexes are available as older preparations. Uh, we, uh, as mentioned the little quoted tablets where you they claim it's released in the duodenum or something like that. The releasing lower part of the gut is not really recommended to be used in pregnancy. Now if you look at the the different uh, and other other option is of course giving parental line certainly. If you give oral line it's effective in most patients. Low risk of adversity and of course low cost. Where if you give oral the more problems are it can cause GIT side effects and the reliability of women taking it, especially if you have second or third pregnancy, how reliable are they taking? Uh, then, uh, of course, you need to continue throughout pregnancy. You can't give it as a single dose. Whereas, in, if you give an intravenous side supplementation, uh, you can give it as a calculated single dose, or maybe over a period of a couple of days. Of course, it's a less uh, side effects, uh, no GIT side effects, you are assured of compliance. Only thing is, um, IV, if you are giving it, you can again, do it in hospital under supervision, and there are problems like allergies and things are there, but they are not so common as uh, sort of sometimes people are worried to give parental line thinking of these reactions, but this doesn't happen so often. Now, as far as a pregnant woman is concerned, we do not use parental line as a routine of obvious reasons. Uh, the main indications for uh, parental line is if you are not if you are not compliant, if you can't rely on the patients. Sometimes if you use people like you want sweeteners and people like that, you, you need to correct things early uh, because you cannot allow them to go to labor with a low hemoglobin because issues. If your iron deficiency does not get corrected with oral iron, and of course if there's a problem with gut because of absorption. And generally it is recommended to avoid any kind of parental iron in the first trimester. We do not know exactly. There is no definite data to say it's harmful, but still the safety of parental line in the first trimester is not being established very well. The first trimester being the period of organogenesis, I think it's important that we take care. Again, don't look at this slide, I mean, anybody wants I can give it, it's there. Uh, there are many different types of parent plan preparations. I mean, we used to have Benefer earlier, I want to know what is the, maybe different to, uh, but there are so many different types of parent plan and their dosage regimes are different and uh, whether they can be given, and most of these parent plan you cannot give it, you have to calculate the dose, but you will not be able to give the total calculation just over a single day. Depending on the preparation, you need to decide how much maximum dose of parent line you can give per day. Sometimes combination with uh, uh, erythropoietin is being done if there is an indication to do so. So um, that is where uh, actually uh, that uh, covers the iron deficiency part, I think, don't think we I thought it was iron anyway in pregnancy and just did a few slides on hemoglobin in pregnancy because that's the other important one that is relevant to pregnancy and it's quickly comes through. The main implications of uh, the thalassemia that we see commonly, I mean, we don't see people who are thalassemic getting pregnant. Uh, they are, of course, not they are iron deficient, they are iron overloaded. Uh, as you know, they are generally they have problem of fertility as well. But if they get pregnant, the main issues are the ones that are listed on the right side. Okay, the, 
thrombotic effects, mean for transfusion, risk of infections, because of the uh, pancreatic function and pancreatic effect, they can have any of the other medical problems coming. Common one we see is the minor or thalassemic traits. Generally, they are not a problem. Uh, only thing we do, usually do the ferritin levels and that if the ferritins are low, about less than about 30, then you can think of still giving oral iron uh, supplementation. Of course, these patients better to avoid parenteral iron supplementation. that perhaps you would like to know is the importance of prenatal testing in, uh, in people who are given thalassemics. Right? So you, could, uh, you can either, you can screen them antenatally, uh, whether they, to see whether the baby is affected or not, especially using either use the, at about 8 to 10, 10 to 12 weeks you can do a choline equivalent sampling. Or now we have, although this is not very well established, you can take a non-invasive prenatal testing after about 10 to 14 weeks, especially this is used for screening Down syndrome and uh, other aneuploidies. Uh, but this is being tried to, uh, being, uh, they are sort of uh, trying to use this to screen the hemoglobin things as well. And the other way that you can screen, of course, in IVF, before implantation, of putting an embryo back into the uterus, you could stay in for any kind of uh, abnormality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Atul Karayarachi, for that uh, nice overview. It uh, has uh, set the stage for the next presenter because he was talking about the problems in pregnancy leading to anemia in children. Uh, so, we will take questions at the end of all three presentations. And I would like to now invite Dr. Sachin Pirthananda, who is a consultant pediatrician and a senior lecturer in the Department of Pediatrics in the University of Kalania to do his presentation on anemia in children.
by the WHO cut off values and definitions which says in general between 6 months to 5 years hemoglobin less than 11 is considered as anemia. In children above 5 hemoglobin less than 11.5 is considered as anemia. With these cut off the prevalence of anemia in Sri Lanka is approximately 15%. It's quite high. So we know the cut off values for babies who are above 6 months and what's the scenario in babies who are less than 6 months. There are no cut off values because the hemoglobin has a physiological change during first 6 months which is demonstrated in this graph. Concentrate only the graph here which shows the hemoglobin and minus 2 standard deviations. As you can see, the babies who are born at term have a hemoglobin of approximately 50 to 24 grams with a mean of roughly close to 20 grams. But this hemoglobin will drastically drop during the next two months due to several reasons. Firstly, in utero, the fetus is in an oxygen deprived environment. After birth, you get plenty of oxygen, so you are not in a hypoxic situation. Secondly, you have a physiological transition from hemoglobin F to hemoglobin A, which is a hemoglobin molecule which releases oxygen 5 TC. Due to these two reasons, the baby will not need much of hemoglobin. So the hemoglobin will drop because of the hemolysis to a lower level as low as 9 grams per deciliter. And the lowest value is reported around 6 weeks to 8. So if a baby comes with a hemoglobin of 9 at 2 months, if the red cell indices are normal, are not worried. That's a physiological anemia of infancy, which will, then the erythropoietin will start producing and the hemoglobin will gradually go up to reach 11 grams per deciliter at 6 months. So coming back to the case, for the patient, 11 month old child has hemoglobin of 10.5. All the full blood count reports will give you red cell indices and the NCV is 67, NCH is 53. So 29. As we know, anemia can be classified based on red cell indices into microcytic, normocytic, and macrocytic. The cutoff value for microcytosis in children is somewhere between 60, 70, and 80. But you know, MCV of 67 is low. So this child has microcytic anemia. The most likely diagnosis for microcytic anemia in children or even in adults is high intelligence anemia. So it's very likely that this child has high intelligence anemia. As previous speakers have correctly pointed out, iron deficiency is a sort of a spectrum. Initially, they will only have iron deficiency with low iron stores with normal hemoglobin, but when it is being continued, you will develop iron deficiency anemia. What are the risk factors for iron deficiency in children? Iron deficiency is extremely rare between 0 to 6 months, unless there is maternal iron deficiency or prematurity, because the iron transfers during the trimester, if the baby is delivered at 28 weeks, they will have very low iron stores or unless there is a, any sort of perinatal hemorrhage. So we don't see babies below 6 months having iron. But it is extremely common in later infancy as well as during the first few years of life. And the most important force for iron deficiency in children is insufficient dietary Similarly, occult blood loss may be a cause, for example, Meckel's diverticular, hemangiomas, rarely inflammatory bowel disease, or cookworm infestations or infections, which are extremely rare now in Sri Lanka. During adolescence, it may be due to menstrual blood loss. But the other secondary causes like tumors and those things are not common in children. We don't, we don't consider them in the differential diagnosis if someone comes with higher deficiency. What are the clinical features? 
99% of them will be asymptomatic. So, this will be picked up or detected incidentally. The only clinic, the sort of important clinical feature would be fallow if they have iron deficiency anemia. Again, will not be evident if the hemoglobin is something like 8 or 9, unless it is less than 7. Iron deficiency can sometimes lead to pick up, that means eating of non nutrient substances, pus kanwa, hal kanwa, different, different things. Right? That is quite common in children. That is because of iron deficiency. Or oh, they might ingest sort of desire to ingest ice. When it is severe, you develop anemia and you have all the features of anemia which are common to any sort of anemia. In pediatric practice, they are different to adults, irritability, anorexia, bit of lethargy. When it is severe, there will be cardiovascular compromise with tachycardia, flow murmurs, and if you don't intervene, it will end up in cardiac failure. So, you suspect iron deficiency anemia because there is microcytic hypochromic anemia. So, how are we going to make the diagnosis? Again, this is one of the most common public health problems, but still we do not have a gold standard diagnostic tool. There is no way that we can conclusively diagnose iron deficiency in every time. The most commonly used one is serum ferritin, as we all know, which is quite widely available. Serum ferritin less than 12 or 15, depending on the age, is considered as iron deficiency. However, serum ferritin is an inflammatory marker which can go up drastically in infection or inflammation. Sometimes in, in the bacterial infection, it can be even thousands. In conditions like idiopathic arthritis, it can be 5,000. So, it's a, it's a it's an acute phase protein, so you need to make sure that there is no inflammation or infection to interpret serum ferritin. Serum iron profile on the other hand is less likely to be affected by inflammation, but it's not very widely available. If you want to do, we do serum iron, total iron binding capacity and transferring saturation. In iron deficiency anemia, serum iron will be low. Iron binding capacity or transferrin will be high, transferrin saturation will be less than 16%. But in clinical practice, we generally tend to rely on serum ferritin. There are certain other investigations which are basically in <coughs> research. One is erythrocyte zinc photopropyrin, which will be increased in iron deficiency. Soluble transferrin receptor again will be increased in iron deficiency and the most recent one which is still being optimized is serum FCD which will be decreased in iron deficiency. So, the diagnosis is, is, is possible but have its own pros and cons. To make the diagnosis of iron deficiency when the serum peritin is less than 12 in 6 months to 5 years, so less than 15 in the absence of inflammation. Sometimes, especially in children less than 2 years, we believe most of the, the most likely cause for anemia in this group is iron deficiency. So, there is a place for an empirical trial of iron, the treatment dose of iron, to give it for one week, one month, that is for four weeks, and to demonstrate a response. So, response to a therapeutic trial of iron is again considered as a marker of, so, uh, uh, indicator of iron deficiency or to confirm the iron deficiency. You need to demonstrate the rise of hemoglobin by 1 gram per deciliter. So, it is different to adders. So, we, we only need a rise in hemoglobin 1 gram per deciliter after 4 weeks of appropriate dose of iron. Once confirmed, how are we to treat? Treatment of iron deficiency anemia, we almost always use oral iron because it is very readily absorbed and the response is quite rapid. 3 to 6 milligrams of elemental iron per day. Any ferrous salt, commonly we use ferrous sulfate. Here we have to be a bit careful in pediatric practice. There are syrups, drops, and tablets 
theta ion can be. And at the same time, you have several multivitamin preparations which are containing iron. But most of the multivitamin preparations will have inadequate amount of iron to treat iron deficiency. So, every time you treat a patient with iron deficiency, you need to find out the amount of elemental iron in that preparation. Generally, iron drops will have 50 milligrams of elemental iron in 1 ml, iron syrups 50 milligrams in 5 ml, iron tablet, ferrous sulfate 200 milligram tablet will have 60 milligrams, and there are certain preparations which have 100 milligrams per tablet can be given as a single dose or two to three divided doses. Given between meals, the absorption is highest when it is given 30 minutes before or two hours after a meal. If you give it with a juice, it increases absorption. Side effects are minimal. It has an unpleasant taste and a bit of gastrointestinal sort of complaints in older children. So that's how you would treat iron deficiency. What about other things? It's quite common for us or doctors to prescribe iron, vitamin C, folic acid or sometimes anti ailment things together when you see someone having anemia. If it is microcytic anemia, there is no evidence to suggest giving vitamin C or folic acid along with iron to improve the outcome. So it's not necessary. No point giving vitamin C or folic acid if it is iron deficiency. Anti-helminthic treatment, probably there's no place in Sri Lanka because hookworm infections are extremely rare now. It's less than 0-1% in most of the places. That's the only word that or trichuris are the ones that will cause iron deficiency. It is not a cause, it will not be the complication of pinworm infestation that we generally have in the country. So, anti helminthics are not really needed. Parenteral iron, I have probably used only once, it's very rare to be used. Only in the presence of malabsorption, you will be using parenteral iron. Blood transfusions, again very rare, unless the patient is in impending cardiac failure. The hemoglobin is very low, maybe 4 or 3, or they are about to go into cardiac failure, or unless there is ongoing blood loss. So, the treatment of iron deficiency is very easy. You can do it as an outpatient by oral iron treatment. The other thing, important thing is to advise on that, especially in kids. You need to advise them to take iron rich food. What I tell them is, Fish, meat, egg yolk, green leaves and pulses. Fish, meat, egg yolk, green leaves and pulses. And you can use some iron fortified food, that's up to them. If you take some vitamin C containing food, along with iron containing food, it might increase the absorption. If you take tea or coffee along with the meals, it will decrease the absorption. Just prescribing iron and giving dietary advice is not sufficient. You need to make sure that this child recovers. This child hemoglobin goes up. The easiest way is to repeat the hemoglobin after one month. It's iron deficiency. You have to demonstrate one gram of deciliter rice. If you are desperate, if you want to see the response early, you can do a reticulocyte count which will be evident within 3, 2 to 4 days. But it's not essential. So you do hemoglobin, and when the hemoglobin is normalized, when it is about 11, you continue iron for another three months to make sure the stores are repeated. We are generally we generally don't repeat serum. But if you continue for another three months, then that will increase the serum. Some situations of iron deficiency, you will not see the price. It will be refracted. So, what are the causes? One can be poor compliance, but if you have given the adequate dose and the mother thinks that we have taken, so that's unlikely. So, you will need to think about occult blood loss, whether there is any sort of celiac disease, cause with protein intolerance, some sort of occult blood loss you may have to invest. 
and there are rare forms of inherited conditions which are known as iron refractory iron deficiency anemia. Those are, so these patients have microcytic anemia, serum ferritin is low, you give iron, they don't respond. So there is definite iron deficiency, it is not a hemoglobinopathy. There is iron deficiency but very poor response. Can be iron refractory iron deficiency anemia which are rare. Those are mostly molecular defects, genetic defects which are being increasingly identified. These are rare new entities of iron absorption, transport and utilization. Diagnosis is extremely difficult in this country. Usually requires genetic diagnosis. But if you want to treat intravenous iron may be useful in some scenarios. Some of them will be on regular blood transfusion. That's iron refractory iron deficiency anemia. Another entity in pediatric practice is non-anemic iron deficiency. So as we learn, you have first develop iron deficiency, then when it is only severe and prolonged, you develop anemia. And people think there are consequences of iron deficiency in other organs apart from in the red blood cell. So there are, there are claims that the iron deficiency per se, not anemia, will have neurodevelopmental adversities, may be impaired psychomotor mental development, attention deficit, low mathematical skills, so it's important in immunity, but still these are not 100% proven. Most people believe that they are, they are there, but some people say it's not as bad as they were, they were initially. So there is an entity called non-anemic iron deficiency which will have some cognitive effect in the child. And some claim that even after treatment these are irreversible. But open for discussion, I am not also very convinced. Prevention of iron deficiency has been the sort of a the, uh, important topic in the preventive field and the WHO. So we need a dietary requirement that usually 1 mg per day is needed to be absorbed. Normal diet, the bioavailability about 10%, so generally someone will require 7 to 10 mg per day. Bioavailability of iron is different in different foods. In breast milk it's about 50%, other formulates less. And it's higher in heme iron, heme iron is the animal form of iron, which is about 30% and non heme iron 10 so by having an iron rich meal, you can prevent iron deficiency. And there is a, there's a movement for iron supplementation as well. Whether we need that is, is a question. The available evidence is supplementation, universal supplementation. That means giving iron prevention dose or supplementary dose to every child in this country and maybe in the world. It seems to be reducing iron deficiency but we don't know the adversities of giving enough iron to a child who has normal amounts of iron. What's happening in the country at the moment is we are supplementing iron to a certain degree. We are neither there nor here. So there are two programs run by the Family Health Bureau. One is called Multiple Micronutrient Supplementation where babies are given sachets contains iron and other micronutrients to be mixed with food and give for two months at six months, one year and eighteen months. It contains about 10 milligrams of elemental iron. But the problem with this is no one is taking. So it's been given when you add that to the food that makes a metallic taste, the children are refusing. So the sort of program that is meant to counteract micronutrient deficiencies are seems to increase the macronutrient deficiencies because they are now not even if they are not eating even the food, the rice. So it's 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 probably a failure in the part of our healthcare system. It's, it's, it's no one is taking it. And there's a movement sort of the protocol or a guideline to give iron to school children during school medical inspection, which is happening at 1, 4 and 7 years. When they are at grade 1, 4 and 7, 
and the recommendation is to give them one tablet of ferrous sulfate, folic acid, vitamin C, once a week for six months. Again, this has problem. It's not universally practiced, and I don't know whether it's useful to give it once a week or because the absorption will be quite limited and for six months. And the problem is it's it's quite risky. So what they do is to give the entire pack to the child. And we had several kids. Because they are they are being kids, they eat all the tablets in one go, maybe competition, and they come with iron overload and the complication of iron toxicity, right? Not overload, iron toxicity and we have to they have to be admitted and given gastric or whatever the management of iron toxicity has to be done. So both these interventions have their own problems. So probably best would be to have iron rich diet. Two more slides on the differential diagnosis of microcytic anemia because most of you might know my topic is thalassemia, that's my favorite. So, Although the topic is iron deficiency, I need to tell you not all microcytic anemia in this country or in children is due to iron deficiency. It is a small study of 104 children, Raghaman, who are diagnosed to have microcytic anemia. Hemoglobin less than 11, MCV less than 70. And when we, we extensively investigated with ferritin, hemoglobin HDLC and genetic testing for alpha thalassemia, and only 49% of them had iron deficiency. 10% had beta thalassemia trait and 16% had alpha thalassemia trait. Alpha thalassemia trait is something which is not clinically significant in this country, but that's a well-known cause for microcytic anemia. And importantly, those three conditions are co tend to coexist. So, there were four who had iron deficiency as well as beta thalassemia trait and three with iron deficiency and alpha thalassemia trait. So, if you don't investigate, you might not be there. So, being iron deficient will not make them not have alpha thalassemia or beta thalassemia. So, how are we going to confirm the diagnosis of thalassemia trait? To, for completion, if beta thalassemia trait can be easily confirmed by hemoglobin H which are freely done in centers, designated thalassemia centers in the country. But the alpha thalassemia trait is difficult to diagnose unless you have genetic testing. So in summary, we know the prevalence of anemia in Sri Lankan children is 15%. Not all children with anemia in Sri Lanka has iron deficiency. However, the majority will have iron deficiency. Diagnosis, still we don't have a gold standard test, but the serum ferritin is the common use. Treatment, oral iron treatment, dose of iron, parenteral iron no blood transfusions are rarely necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sajid Vitananda, for that nice overview on iron deficiency and in your pregnancy. Uh, I would like to now invite all three speakers uh, up on stage for a uh, discussion on any Generally not. Generally not. If you if you if you 
encounter a child less than six months having iron deficiency anemia, then you go back and see. But it's, most of the time, the anemic mothers will deliver babies who have normal hemoglobin as well as normal. If, if you don't have to investigate, neither treat. The only base if the mother is only having iron deficiency. But it's always good to investigate the mother. The mother may be having thalassemia trait. In that case, that it's likely to be the case that maybe it develops anemia. But the thalassemia trait, again, needs to be confirmed after six months, not before. Yes, I know the current situation in the for two second no, we are talking about delayed cord clamping. Yeah, delayed cord clamping. Yeah. Delayed cord clamping basically is to what is known is if you delay the cord clamping for about one to two minutes, you send addition about eight ml blood to the baby and that helps to reduce the incidence of that That's sure. But, and that is what the recommendation is and that is what is practiced. Delayed cord clamping. Thank you very much for all the three lectures, sir. Uh, I would like to ask in a situation of sepsis, is it uh, uh, giving iron treatment at a uh, condition of sepsis? Is there a contraindication? That's again, that has been the practice, not to give iron thinking that they can prevent the sepsis. But I haven't found anywhere, I haven't read conclusive evidence to support that. I don't know whether you have anything to add. Generally, it's, it's someone can argue why you need, why why you don't give, you don't give during this period and then restart. But I personally have been continuing. There's no evidence as such for me to conclusively say that giving iron treatment or a small treatment dose during infection is very harmful. But there are theoretical risks which you hold. Yeah, there's this uh, theoretical thing. Why is hepcidin there? So in the infection and inflammation, hepcidin is secreted from the river to stop the iron being absorbed and the iron being mobilized from the macrophages into the into the hemopoietic system. And excess of iron in blood, sort of absence of low iron in blood may Theoretically, reduce the bacterial uh, division. So that's a theoretical thing. And there is this fear of iron supplementation in African children, universal iron supplementation in African children, that it could increase the malaria in sub Saharan Africa if you give iron to them. Those are the only instances that I have heard. And of course, in our world, we don't give iron uh, during uh, the infection, not because we, uh, we are afraid of sepsis, we don't give iron. child is having anemia, then what we can do for that condition? So, thalassemia trait children will, most of them will have hemoglobin anemia, something not. But you need to demonstrate iron deficiency. If they are iron deficient, you do a serum peritin, the serum peritin is less than 15 or 12, they are also having thalassemia trait on top of that iron deficiency. In that is iron treatment is indicated. But if they are iron sufficient, no reason to divide even if they are anemic because the anemia is purely because of the thalassemia trait. Can I just ask one question from Dr. Bolis and I that you suggested a very practical uh, suggestion that if you find iron deficiency anemia in a you know adult without going through all the you know uh, investigations which are very costly. You can just start iron treatment 
and if there is lack of response or something like that, then to uh, investigate further. Uh, would you recommend doing at least serum ferritin in these patients, uh, you know, before starting iron or, or, or with, with just a um, uh, full blood count you can go ahead with your recommendation? I think uh, if, a, if a person is anemic, we have to make the diagnosis. Why is he anemic? I think the diagnosis of iron deficiency anemia is important. But treating the iron deficiency anemia and investigating for the cause of anemia is different. Say if your patient is now if the patient is in the, the stage where there is increased iron uh, need, say the, the children, the adolescents, the menstruating women and pregnant women, if they are iron deficient, you treat the iron deficiency and see the need. But if your patient is in the at risk age group of cancer, if there is iron deficiency anemia, I would extensively investigate that person, why that person is iron deficient. That is where we sort of cut off the right? if, if you have clinical suspicion, if, you are, if, you are, if your patient is at risk of a cancer, possibly bleeding. The other instance where we investigate is the patient has definite iron deficiency anemia and is not responding to iron. Then also we do investigate. So what I'm saying is if the patient is a pregnant child or uh, you know somebody like that, uh, then in that situation you can give a trial of iron but otherwise if it's elderly person and, you know, who can be having uh, you know underlying malignancy or something like that. You do the stool local blood and the, the upper and lower ear endoscopies and if still if you can't find the reason, there's a place for capsular video endoscopy. Okay. Can I suggest the special if you look at any any uh, guideline in uh, management of any uh, in pregnancy, uh, even in, in the UK guidelines, that is what is recommended. If you have a, say if you look at one third of people and if you start doing serum fetus in all these patients and you will the cost and the one case you will do on one third of women unnecessarily. What is recommended is you treat with iron and see the response. You can see the response in two ways. Generally the hemoglobin level increase by about 0.8 grams per deciliter per week. And that's the usual rise. And or the rising that it comes. You can assess. And if they are responding, you don't investigate further, treat them with iron. And then you can. Yeah, may I add another thing? Say all, all of these full blood counts that we get, you have the, 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 the red blood cell indices. If your patient has microcytic hypochromic anemia, I don't think that we should do the ferritin. But, so we have a high percentage of thalassemia traits in the country. So to, to sort of rule out those, I would look at the red cell distribution width. The red cell distribution width, uh, correct me if I am wrong, it's around normally 50. Yes, 30 to 50. If you have a, if you have iron deficiency anemia, the patients will have uh, the, the poikilocytosis, the different sizes and different shapes of red cells. So the red cell distribution width will be more than 50. So it will be 17, 18, 20. So those patients you look at without any doubt you can treat them with iron. But if your red cell distribution is with RDW is normal, I think those patients should be investigated for the possibility of thalassemia trait. We had a good uh, you know, discussion as well. Uh, so let me thank uh, the three speakers on behalf of the Sri Lanka Medical Association for their very comprehensive presentation as well as you know, clarifying all the uh, you know, questions that were raised during the discussion for me. Uh, it is now my pleasure to uh, invite them to receive the uh, appreciation certificates and the lectures.